Good morning, everyone. By now, you should get that down. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, Commissioner, congratulations on being confirmed as the Commissioner of the CPP this past March. Uh, we're we're Thank very you. excited to have you here. And secondly, I think even more importantly, welcome back home to California, to Los Absolutely. Angeles. Absolutely. Good to be home. No and, question. And uh, I understand your mom is here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can uh, you stand where are up? you, mom? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's how we entice the commissioner to come out. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you obviously you spent a, uh, a significant part of your career here in, in uh, Los Angeles and in California, uh, including a, a stint as the port of director here at the LA. Um, how do you see this impacting your leadership style and in your managing of the, of the CBP? Well, th thanks, Brian, and it's great, it's great to be home. Uh, and my, my stint at the port of LAX uh, was, was a huge uh, factor and impact on my career. I just want to note really quickly that whoever scheduled me after Mayor Garcetti spoke, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have a conversation with them because what an impressive uh, leader and, and a tremendous set of remarks this morning. Uh, but for me, uh, being Port Director at LAX was a dream job, the uh, best job I'll ever have. Uh, not only was I home uh, and, and around friends and family, uh, living in Marina del Rey, not so bad. Uh, <laughs> you know, we just had a, a new baby. It was a lot of fun on the personal side. But, but just that level of leadership, I think, is a great level, right? You have an executive strategic oversight. We had 17 facilities all over uh, Southern California, all the way to Las Vegas. Uh, but you also have the opportunity to engage with your frontline workforce uh, and, and really uh, see the tangible results of your decision. So I, I, that was uh, a tremendous experience. Uh, but on, on the partnership side, understanding how to work with Los Angeles World Airport, it's a really dynamic and innovative airport partner that's doing great things with us today. Uh, with the air carriers at LAX, the customs brokers. I see Vince Iacopella right in the front row. He introduced me in my first set of remarks uh, at LAX in 2006. Um, you know, that, that understanding that ecosystem and how CBP can support it uh, and learn from it, uh, as well as ha we have to regulate and secure it, uh, was tremendous. And then I think that the last lesson that I've tried to take with me, too, maybe, uh, from that experience is interacting uh, with, with the traveling public and, and realizing that this is, you know, five years after 9-11, we had been extraordinarily security focused uh, every minute of the day uh, fr from that uh, tragic attack, but realizing that we had a responsibility for that traveler's experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's taken a while, but we've worked very hard to innovate uh, to improve that experience, whether it's global entry, whether it's the technology and the kiosks that we're using, uh, but, but seeing our officers deal with a stamp that was the same stamp they used at Ellis Island, uh, you, you seeing them uh, work with a hard copy paper declarations and, and trying to envision a future where that could be automated. Uh, and, and really we're working with LAWA to take it to the next level uh, using facial recognition to, to speed the process even further. So I, I learned a lot of lessons here that stay with me every day in my role as commissioner. So in your new role, I think the audience would appreciate hearing your macro vision for the CBP in terms of its as part, you know, it's a role with the international trade and the international trade community. Well, we got a lot to do. The introduction always is intimidating, right? They, oh, you have all these missions and all these people. Uh, so I, I've articulated 26 mission priorities, which uh, a consultant told me was ridiculous. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we're, we're a big agency. So, so actually, I, I've, in the vision side, I've tried to, to reduce that focus uh, so that the people know what we're really trying to accomplish. And, and my vision for CBP uh, is to be the most innovative, most effective, and most trusted law enforcement agency in the United States, uh, th that full stop. And, and I think we need to do that by investing in our people uh, on, on the front end, finding that human capital in a 3.9% unemployment environment with st uh, stringent background requirements, uh, but also accelerating their, the development and, and delivery of new technologies into our officers and agents' hands so they can be more effective. Uh, then thirdly, really emphasizing partnership. Uh, and, and that's across our interagency in the federal government where we help coordinate uh, the authorities and actions of 48 different uh, departments and agencies at the border, uh, but also really importantly and really importantly for you, uh, our international uh, partnerships. Uh, and then lastly, uh, transforming our stakeholder experience, how we interact with, with our, or our customs partners on the, on the broker side, uh, with our importers and exporters, uh, but also with the traveling public. Uh, th those are the four hallmarks of, of what we're going to try to accomplish in the next several years. But in terms of trade, and, and I, this has been, I think, hopefully well received by our trade community partners, is, is CBP is not going to deviate uh, from the, the grand bargain that, that a, uh, a very strong Angelino, our first commissioner, Robert C. Bonner, uh, articulated and made after 9-11. Uh, that, that if he reached out to the trade community through a development of a program called Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism, 
And what he said is, if you work with us, uh, if you give us information uh, about your legitimate goods, uh, if you let us partner with you uh, to secure and, and determine the integrity of your supply chain, we're going to respond with speed and predictability uh, for your processes. Uh, and, and I think we've, we've met that commitment, but we can always improve. And, and that's why in, in the next several years, you're, you're going to see continued development along those lines in, in terms of securing sub, uh, trade lanes, in, in terms of intelligent enforcement, uh, really focused on those limited numbers of, of, of goods that, that cause problems crossing the border, uh, and then extending our, our partnerships uh, internationally uh, and with the trade community. So that's how I'm going to pursue the trade uh, piece of our mission. I think it sounds great. Uh, good luck. Yes. <laughs> well, well, we need, well, we've got good partners right here in this room, frankly, that, that help us do it. I think so. Well, is there a particular uh, challenge or concern that you would like to tackle you know, during your role as, as commissioner? You know, on the trade side in particular, I, I, I guess the, the, the common uh, challenge we have in any transition is, is ensuring that, that the broader uh, stakeholder environment, the external authorizing environment, as we would say academically in DC, understands the role of CBP, uh, understands how we can be an empowering and enabling force for the economy. Uh, we recently did a study that, sh that showed we have an office of, of international trade, which uh, for the world's largest economy still, uh, you know, a thousand people might not sound like enough uh, to set policy and to set strategic uh, processes and, and partnerships with the trade industry. Uh, but these, these people generated over $10 billion in economic value uh, b based on a rigorous study. Just think about a, a, an auditor uh, in ensuring that a supply chain has integrity or uh, a, a rulings attorney trying to give clarity to a participant in the supply chain on how their goods will be treated when they cross the border and having that predictability up front, the value that adds. So I, I'm, I'm going to try to communicate that effectively uh, both to our, our, our leaders in Congress uh, and the trade community that, that we, we can take down those supply chain barriers if, if we get strategic investments mm -hmm. and the right personnel and the right technology, the right international presence, as you understand well, based on your background, uh, to, to really improve the entire mm -hmm. system. Great. So allow me to read a statement from the CBP website, if I could, and okay. ask you a couple questions related to that. That's a little scary. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure we're communicating with precision in, on, on the website. I had to make sure it was still up okay. there, so. Yeah. <laughs> The U.S. Customs and Border Protection has direct responsibility for enhancing U.S. economic competitiveness and is working to enable legitimate trade to contribute to American economic prosperity and protect against risk to the public health and safety. So in terms of this statement as it relates to programs and operational impacts for our, our international trade community here in the audience today, um, first of all, we've heard this morning a lot about digital trade and it's had a significant impact and change in how we conduct sure. global e-commerce, yeah. buyer and seller habits, logistics industry obviously is impacted by this. What is the role of CPP and how is it currently working in the e-commerce realm in, in you know, dealing with this, you know, this new wave of, of digital trade? Sure, I, I mean, e-commerce, as you heard uh, this morning from the last two speakers, it has been completely revolutionary. I, I, would, I would call it the biggest change in the supply chain since uh, the, the ocean going container. Uh, and it's, it's really, I can just give you a sense of the volume change just for us. In, in five years, uh, international mail packages have grown five-fold, okay, uh, in, in five years. Uh, th th that's, that's an incredible growth rate. Express consignment, the FedExes and UPS, DHL, is up 50%. Uh, so just think about all of the impacts uh, from facilities to staffing to the types and proliferation of threats uh, if you can go uh, direct from a consumer uh, to, to a foreign manufacturer to, to make that purchase. So we, we've got to transform our approach to this, this emerging element mm -hmm. of the supply chain. Uh, and and we've, we've taken a number of steps, but we just uh, recently published an e-commerce strategy uh, and developed an e-commerce uh, group in our Office of Trade that, that's really focused on e-commerce issues. Uh, and it's really trying to tackle it from every uh, angle. The legal and regulatory uh, environment, uh, international mail shipments uh, traditionally have not provided the same amount of information on what's in them uh, as they cross a border, and that makes it harder to sort uh, and identify what might present a risk and what might need regulatory oversight. Uh, so we've got to work through that. Uh, transforming our own operations. Uh, we, we know the threats we're seeing in the mail environment, uh, think about synthetic opioids, the, the crisis that we're facing nationally uh, with overdose deaths. We need to find a way to identify these tiny vials of tremendously potent uh, narcotics coming through our mail system uh, before they can get into our communities. Uh, so we're transforming that from the beginning. 
getting advanced data for, with our U.S. Postal Service partners uh, from China in particular, and they've really come through with increased electronic data uh, submission uh, from China Post. Uh, working on our staffing in our mail facilities, training our canines uh, to be able to detect this new kind of synthetic opioid, uh, and then having the, the technology, we call it non-intrusive inspection technology, x-rays, uh, but computed tomography and more advanced versions that can interrogate those packages without opening them. We're not going to be able to open 1.7 million parcels a day to make sure there's nothing dangerous in there. We're never going to get there. We have to be able to sort it for risk. We have to be able to identify what's in there without opening it. Uh, and then we have to be able to work with investigators and state and local law enforcement to address those networks that are trying to profit uh, from this increasing addiction. So, so that's a key area uh, of, of e-commerce for us. Uh, intellectual property rights, you could tell a similar story in how uh, they violate our, our uh, you know, U.S. businesses and manufacturers' uh, intellectual property. Uh, and then we need to engage the new supply chain entities. Uh, these marketplaces, I mean, the rise of Amazon, Alibaba, we, we have to figure out their role in the supply chain and what, how can we work with them to ensure better compliance uh, in those advertising their services on those marketplaces uh, so that we can make sure it's safe uh, but also facilitate this tremendous growth uh, in e-commerce that, that's so uh, welcomed by the consumers, uh, as you can see. Uh, and then engaging on international trade standards. This is an area where uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection has, has provided leadership globally uh, at the World Customs Organization and elsewhere with the support of the U.S. business community uh, to, to try to set good standards. You see it in, in the trade facilitation agreement uh, as well uh, that we we're implementing and helping other governments implement. Uh, but we've got to be there uh, articulating the best way to manage this. And, and really there's a lot of divergence in how mm -hmm. countries are treating this. Uh, the U.S. went to $800 uh, for a shipment before you need uh, a customs uh, uh, declaration, if you will. Um, there's lots of different ways to do that. Uh, but some countries, Europe is going to zero. Uh, mm -hmm. Other countries are at $20. We're all taking different approaches to this. We need to harmonize and find uh, a path where we can, we can secure that supply chain, we can address uh, safety and other issues, uh, but, but also allow consumers to benefit from this tremendous revolution. Mm -hmm. So that, that's going to be a huge <laughs> challenge uh, that, that we're going to need to continue to work on in partnership with industry. Sure. But it sounds like you've got the, uh, the energy ready to take up that task. So. Well, we got the strategy and the energy. Okay. Uh, now we need to get it done. Uh, so you raise an interesting point, I think. I mean, obviously, there's the enforcement side, the public health and safety side, but we also have to encourage and maintain U.S. economic competitiveness as well. Absolutely. And so how do you balance that, those two roles? And what, maybe let us know more, know more about some of the programs CBP has to enhance economic competitiveness, particularly your centers of excellence. Well, I could ask you this question right back, <laughs> Brian, given your expertise at USTR and, and on uh, protecting uh, American business from, from evasion, <laughs> uh, from dumping uh, on, our, on our markets, uh, or avoiding uh, payment of countervailing duties. Uh, what we've seen in the last several years in Washington is a very clear bipartisan signal that we need to do more in the trade enforcement area. Uh, we, we have our first authorizing statute, the Trade Facilitation Trade Enforcement Act, that we're two years on and implementing. Uh, we're making great progress. Uh, but it's everything from that, that anti-dumping countervailing duty area where uh, we, we managed to save the, the last remaining wire hanger manufacturer <laughs> in the United States and in Alabama from evasive transshipment practices uh, from China through other uh, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, it, it's efforts like that. It's reaching out to the pharmaceutical industry mm -hmm. to protect our intellectual property rights uh, and identify violators through our Centers for Excellence and Expertise that have that national perspective and, and can see where, where different violations are happening at ports around the country, mm -hmm. collaborate with industry uh, to address it. Uh, so we, we have that protection responsibility, mm -hmm. absolutely, and, and we're taking it on. It's a huge priority for the administration, and again, a bipartisan signal from Congress that we need to do better. Mm -hmm. The last area I would highlight in protecting industry, because it's both anti-competitive and humanitarian, uh, is addressing forced labor. That, that mm -hmm. is still a huge element in supply chains, unfortunately, around the world, in, in Africa, in Asia. We, we need to do better with our partners at identifying forced labor in supply chains uh, and not allowing those goods to reach our market. A again, it perverts the, the competitive aspect for American manufacturers who are doing it right and doing responsible sourcing, uh, and it also is just a humanitarian crisis that we need to be a, a strong player in addressing. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned about, and we actually we were talking backstage a little bit about uh, customs. One of your responsibilities is the customs agents and attaches that are around the world in our various embassies. 
And how is Customs CPP working with our international trade partners in both facilitating trade, especially with the digital trade revolution, as you say, but also in enforcement as well? How do we work with our partners in doing both those those sides of the equation? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked about that, and you understand that that global presence, having worked at the embassy, having lived in Japan. I mean, for, for us, it's absolutely essential that we have those partnerships operationally, day-to-day. Mm -hmm. uh, -day. Uh, I, I listened to the mayor and, and his travel schedule, uh, Mexico, uh, Japan, China, Hong Kong, Vietnam. I've been to all those places in the last two years for the same reasons, because there's such dynamic international trade uh, collaboration. Mexico six times in the last year, I should, I should offer how important that partnership is, especially in this region. Um, but operationally, we, we can really improve uh, from where we are. And we've seen that in the last year at our southern border. Uh, we implemented a program called Unified Cargo Processing. It's as simple as it sounds. Instead of having a truck stop on the Mexican side of the border with Mexican Ag Authorities, then Mexican Customs Authorities, then US CBP, wh where we have integrated customs and ag, we're doing it one time together in the same spot. We've got it at eight land border ports. We've seen wait time reductions 50% or more and we've seen heightened security and a lot happier industry uh, from that kind of partnership. I, I just went down uh, last month and signed, or I guess a month and a half ago now, and signed the agreement with the Mexican Ag Authorities so we can do that piece together as well. And, and that's gonna be a really galvanizing trade issue. Very simple idea, but having the trust and partnership to, to in invite uh, Mexican authorities to work with us at the CBP ports of entry or for our officers to be uh, stationed just south of the border so it's a unified process, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's working effectively. We can do more of that. Uh, I, I think about the LA port, LA Long Beach port that helped us uh, with this pr process called Aqualane, where we're allowing our trusted uh, traders that, that pull up in a large vessel to start to connect to the dock and to start unloading containers because they're CTPAT members and we trust their process and supply chain. That's saving hundreds of millions of dollars, I'm told. It's amazing, uh, the impact, and also helping the environment, which is, is critical in this area uh, mm -hmm. as well. So that there's that operational level. And then strategically, we've worked really hard to try to align our supply chain oversight practices with 11 different countries, including the EU, so 28, 28 plus 10, if you will. Uh, those are mutual recognition agreements where we're uh, recognizing their approach to their authorized economic operators and they're recognizing our CTPAT uh, agreement. We have an opportunity to make those operational uh, for our exporters to be able to benefit as they cross foreign borders with ex expedited processing because they, we've asserted to that foreign partner that we trust the supply chain. We, we need to do more in that area. Mm -hmm. And then international, I'll say it again, the standard setting. Yeah. We've got to be a leader uh, and have good standards around the globe. Are you making, do you believe we're making progress in that area in terms of standard setting? Because you said that's so important in terms of, of logistics and international trade um, and doing business. I, I do. I, I think the World Customs Organization, uh, it ha has become a very good venue to, to have this dialogue. We did it with the air cargo environment in terms of the data expected before a package is put on a, a uh, cargo aircraft back after the Yemen air cargo plot in 2010. Uh, and right now, they're grappling with the e-commerce challenge. Uh, we had a team over there two weeks ago uh, for in-depth, uh, intensive discussions on, on the strategy globally. And so we, we had done our homework, and we had gotten the input from the trade community through our commercial operations advisory council and a lot of direct engagement. We were able to bring that to the table. Uh, and so I think w as, as they work on their e-commerce plan, it'll reflect uh, the U.S. trade community's mm -hmm. recommendations and, and our own experience in, in trying to tackle that. So how can members of our audience here, you know, as part of the international trade community at, at all different levels, how can they be more engaged in, you say, some of your advisory committees or in your, as you develop these strategies and implement them, how can they participate and contribute? to your programs? That's a great question, and, but I will say that LA is a model already in that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, partly due to the gentleman right in front of me, uh, Vince Iacopella, who was co-chair of our COAC committee for the last two years, did a tremendous job. But the whole Pacific coast of, of customs brokers and, and importers and exporters, that whole community has been extraordinarily engaged in, in advising us. So I would, I would offer three levels. First of all, your local ports and field offices are there for you. They still are. Uh, they're, they're close. I can see my team uh, right here, Carlos Martel, our DFO, uh, Eva, our head of, of, of trade at the field office here in LA Long Beach. We're, we're, we're there for you and available. That, so that's the first level and will remain so. The Centers for Excellence and Expertise. Uh, over the last several years, we've implemented a program where we've, we've broken down the tariff uh, and, and for each industry, pharmaceuticals, electronics, uh, heavy metals, 
we have a team based in different places around the country that is looking at that from a national perspective, that bringing in the expertise and reaching out to the specialists around the country to provide better answers, better consistency to industry. Uh, so that's the second area. Get to know your CEE that oversees uh, your area of international trade. Uh, and then third, we, we need good people to engage in the national and international policy setting process, whether it's through COAC, whether it's engaging with commerce or USTR, uh, whether it's, it's going to the World Customs Organization. We need U.S. business in Brussels uh, talking about common sense solutions to, to cross-border problems. So uh, I would encourage everyone to reach out, and we want to be available and responsive to that. Mm -hmm. You alluded just a minute ago to the fact of, of the importance and the role model that, that, that our ports and airports here have in the Los Angeles, Southern California region. And, and as we've heard today, you know, over, over $400 billion worth of sea and air cargo passed through our That's ports right. every, you know, it was amazing. And the number of jobs that are generated both locally but even nationally. I think there's one other statistic that's very interesting is that every congressional district of the United States is impacted by trade that flows through our ports. I mean, that's another way of looking at it, I think. So, you know, as, as, we, as we close our, our session here this, this morning, um, any of you know, remarks or thoughts for our international trade community here um, you know, as, as we move forward? So I, I think I'll just reemphasize that we want to both protect and enable your, your global business, your, your cross-border efforts. Uh, we want to reach out to the small and medium enterprises especially. Uh, we, we've had long-term relationships with the big guys. Uh, we we want to make sure we're available and responsive to the small and medium. A and we realize we have a huge role in, in protecting uh, the, ga the major gateways here, uh, LA Long Beach and, and LAX, uh, enabling the smooth trade and travel through those gateways uh, and, and keeping up with the growth. I mean, LAX last year, 9% international uh, air passenger growth, and we reduced wait times by 8% against that growth with no growth in staffing. Uh, that's partly due to technology, uh, and that's partly due to, to better facilities and better partnership with the carriers mm -hmm. and, and the airport. We want to continue doing that. At the seaport, uh, instead of, of stopping a relatively high percentage of containers for potential uh, radiation uh, coming out of the container, we rejiggered our, our alarms. Uh, so our mm -hmm. algorithms are much more sensitive uh, to what's normal in, in radiation. There's a lot of radiation around us and what could be a threat. So we're stopping a fraction of what we used to stop, and those trucks are moving out of the mm -hmm. terminals much more efficiently. That's the kind of thing we need to keep doing, and mm -hmm. that's our commitment uh, to the major gateways here in Los Angeles. Uh, and protecting the, the tech, the entertainment, and the aerospace industry's IP. Uh, we need to do that more effectively as well. Yeah. We have got a lot of challenges, but I think we all agree that the CPB is in very good hands with you, and uh, congratulations again on your confirmation, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to here today, and hopefully you can spend time with your family while you're out here. But thank you very much. Thanks so much, Brian. Yeah. Good to see you. Thanks, everybody.